Hello and welcome back to chapter 6. Uh, this is a chapter that's got a lot of information in it, like many of the other chapters. Um, and management is, uh, I think it's an underappreciated art. I think, um, regrettably, many of us have uh, experienced what poor management looks like, and a fewer number of us have, rec or have really seen what good management looks like. And so we can, uh, because of our experiences, we can kind of underappreciate the discipline. But the discipline done well uh, can really make a, a big impact on an organization and make uh, things really function, run, and work better uh, when management is really executed at a high level. And, and that, of course, should be our goal. So, of course, we, we know what managers do. I mean, they plan, organize, direct, control. And so they're really trying to organize the work to make the work either more efficient or more effective. And I think one of the difficulties is that sometimes I think it's easier or, I don't know, for whatever reason, we tend to focus more on efficiency as opposed to effectiveness. And so we're always concerned, it seems like, with productivity and you know greater rates of throughput and uh, just getting faster at things but there's a difference between being faster at things and actually being better at things uh, you know being more effective achieving your outcomes uh, at a higher level uh, and so those are not necessarily always competing goals but there tends to be an emphasis on one versus the other and I think many of us uh, have experienced that in the past. So planning, organizing, directing, and controlling. So one of the things that happens is these things are sometimes done all by the same manager, but more often than not, they're done by different layers of the organization. And so the high levels of the organization tend to be focusing on strategic management or strategic planning. Uh, then you may have some organizing of the work that goes on uh, at a different level. Uh, frontline supervisors may be directing or controlling uh, the work to make sure that whatever the goals of the organization are ultimately met. And so again, these things can be done by any of us or anyone, but they tend to be layered differently throughout uh, an organization high-level executives tend to spend more time planning and in meetings and then lower level management people tend to spend more time with direct uh, employees that are actually doing the work of the organization so i've mentioned a couple of types of uh, planning or some things that go on as management functions and so here's a, a brief list of things that might happen um, mission statements or vision statements uh, they're an attempt to try to get at the purpose and f of an organization to try to articulate um, sort of a core uh, purpose that uh, can sort of resonate with all of the employees as the company goes about doing what it is it's going to do. You may have some core values. Uh, and one of the things that may happen here is that your core values as you articulate them uh, like any of us, they may not always end up being exactly what we do. And so um, we like to see congruency in these areas where our mission, our purpose, our vision, our values, uh, how we go about doing things are all in alignment. And what we say is the reality of what we do also. Um, that's a sign of a very healthy organization that's functioning well. Um, so core values might be statements along the lines of what your uh, values really are. We can spend some time doing SWOT analysis, which would be strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, strengths and weaknesses tend to be internal. Opportunities and threats tend to be external. But this is, um, I think of this as one of many ways to do sort of an environmental scan or a scan of an organization to see where things are at. And you might, you might think about this, you could, um, you know, you could build a, a two by two square box matrix and think about the strengths of the college, the weaknesses of the college, some opportunities that the college might have and then some potential threats to the college and you might just simply list them as a bullet 
you know, a series of bullet lists. And that would give you a sense of sort of the environment in which uh, the college functions or operates. You can apply this to any business that you encounter. You could also apply it to, apply it to your uh, to yourself and you would have certain strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats and that might give you some sense or might be part of uh, a planning process that you could go through. From the above items then you can move into goals and objectives. Um, I'm a big fan of SMART goals so goals that are specific, measurable, obtainable, uh, realistic and time bound um, but you can have any kind of a goal making process and then from that you can come up with specific objectives that you're trying to uh, accomplish and then from there you can get uh, generally referred to tactical and operational plans you can start getting into the specifics or the nuts and bolts of how to actually make something uh, happen so I mentioned SWOT analysis strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats uh, with the strengths and weaknesses being primarily internal and the opportunities and threats being primarily external so um, so just to give you just to go just one item from each one so um, you know strengths are things that you do well weaknesses are things that you uh, have lots of room for improvement or maybe don't do well or structurally are not really possible for you uh, opportunities are uh, things that you might take advantage of in the future and then uh, threats are usually from competition although uh, in addition to competition there can be changes in the technology environment changes in laws uh, you know different things that can threaten or make it more difficult for an organization to be uh, successful so different types of plans uh, really going from big picture to uh, implementation with the exception of the contingency and the crisis plans which are sort of separate entities but strategic plan really looking at um, you know things like SWOT analysis doing the environmental scan thinking about the vision mission purpose of the organization trying to communicate those strategic plans uh, identifying uh, at a high level maybe markets that you want to enter and markets that you want to exit um, so strategic planning is really sort of the big picture stuff the tactical and the operational planning is then getting into how to implement um, the strategic plan or the strategic vision of the organization and so operational planning being really down at the lowest level uh, maybe your procedures on how you do stuff uh, you know sp specific goals and objectives at the at the smallest unit levels and then I really think of tactical planning as is kind of in between the two it's much more specific than the strategic planning um, it may involve some metrics but it's not quite as detailed or it's not I guess it's detailed but it's maybe not uh, it's not a single step imp implementation we're not at the level where um, you know we're talking to people about how things are done or, or what specifically to do so think of this as on a continuum uh, from big picture to specific detail as you move down contingency planning is um, you know the what if uh, I think we're more familiar with this now that we, uh, you know, many of us have played with Excel and you can do what if uh, situational analysis, change numbers and start to see what's happening. And so contingency planning is really just thinking about the different forks in the road that might happen uh, and what um, your response might be under different uh, situations. It's often thought that uh, being reactionary is not a uh, not where we do our best work and so contingency planning allows us to get a little bit ahead of what might happen so that we're not being reactionary uh, to to things that creep up crisis management um, is really as as its name indicates dealing with crises as they occur uh, there are things that happen that are difficult to predict um, and so you you may spend a little bit of time trying to figure out how you might deal with some of these situations that are really could blindside blind blindside you. Many companies now um, 
are thinking about in developing uh, what they refer to as disaster recovery plans. So, you know, what if they what do they do if you know the plant in the Midwest is hit by a tornado? What do they do if um, you know if the uh, home office is gobbled up in a fire? Uh, these types of things. Um, if you can buy insurance for them, generally that means that there's some risk that this event might occur because an insurance market exists for things that occur infrequently but are somewhat predictable. And and so if for those types of things, it's good to do a little scenario planning and a little disaster recovery work so that in the event something like that comes up, you've got a, a backup plan and a way to move forward. So I mentioned the levels of management before <clears throat> with high level management. You can see here um, the top level managers are uh, doing the planning and the decision making, the scans of the environment, setting the objectives. Um, middle managers, which is a very difficult job, are often the communication links between uh, where the work's really being done and where the decision making and the planning is happening. So they're, they're spending a lot of time uh, both equipping the lower level managers with the resources they need to be effective and then also communicating uh, both results and needs to upper level management. And then line managers tend to uh, supervise uh, workers that are directly working on um, the company's goods or services. And so um, many people, their first management job will be as a line supervisor or as a, you know, a lead of some kind uh, in a work group. And so these are, are different layers. Of course, in a very small organization, all of these functions might be done by the sole proprietor or you know, if you've got a 20 person organization, management may do all of these things uh, because you know, the size of the entity makes it necessary. So as an organization gets bigger, you have to start developing an organizational structure. So it becomes inefficient to have just a completely flat organization and to communicate everything to everybody because you'll quickly inundate people with a lot of information that they don't particularly need and they'll spend all of their time processing everything that's going on rather than doing um, you know, some division of the labor, some uh, smaller piece of the work pie. Uh, and so nothing will get done because the organization is uh, immensely flat and um, and everybody is sort of distracted by everything that's going on and so what you do is you you start to organize the work in a different way at that point and you start creating uh, hierarchies and these organizational structures or hierarchies can take a lot of different forms and you should spend some time thinking about what form might serve you well uh, so you can organize an entity around its functions. For example, you can organize it around accounting and finance and marketing and production and management, all these different, you know, functional areas that we're studying as we work through, um, as we work through, uh, the course, but you can also organize, uh, the company around particular products. Um, you can organize it around, uh, targeted customers. You can organize the uh, entity around certain processes or things that it does, and then you can organize it by um, geography. So you could have the European division and the North American division, or you could have the Northwest division and the Midwest division. Um, so all of these, you know, there's a, almost an infinite number of ways to think about trying to organize the work. And I think this is an area that's maybe a little bit overlooked by uh, management, a key function of management besides planning, organizing, controlling all of that stuff. Well, the organizing of the work is a big part of what makes, makes an organization both efficient and effective. Um, you know, trying to make the work as um, streamlined and efficient and effective as possible is really a big part of, uh, of what management uh, should be doing. So here's an example of an organizational chart uh, organized around the functions. Um, 
you know, they got accounting, marketing, operations, and then HR. Uh, so this is just one way of, of organizing things. Um, one of the things with all different ways of organizing an, an entity, once you start to organize it this way, right, you've, you've created this or you've started to build up this hierarchy because being really flat doesn't work very well anymore because it was becoming completely inefficient and leaving you uh, fairly ineffective at what you were trying to do. So you, you need to build up a little bit of, uh, of hierarchy to do a little bit better job of organizing the work, structuring things so that they will flow better. But as you do that, there are certain risks too, right? People will be starting to look after their area of the business more so than looking after the whole. Companies become can become somewhat siloed. You can have difficulties communicating across uh, functional areas or across divisions. And so it's not like this is, you know, always going to work or is just a simple solution that you just always add layers to your organization. There's always a cost to that. And so the real art is trying to find the right trade offs in terms of how much structure do we need to become more efficient and effective. But when do we get to too much structure that it becomes, um, uh, harmful or starts to uh, denigrate or deplete our abilities. So you can also organize around divisions. Here you can see that they've got, uh, uh, you know, divisional structures by product. They've got uh, vice president of rides and concession. And then you've got uh, a division by customer base. So in a bank, you could have a vice president of retail customers or a vice president of like business or commercial customers. And so again, many different ways to organize. <clears throat> the trick is to find the one that will really work exceptionally well in your industry. And this is something that, you know, an organization should revisit from time to time because your industry or your, uh, your entity changes, the markets in which you operate change over time. And so sometimes the structure that you fell into when you were uh, a growing organization uh, may not serve you as well as maybe a different organiza organizational structure would uh, as you sort of get farther along in a company's development. A matrix structure is um, sort of a hybrid <clears throat> where you've got different people in charge of uh, different things and so you can see here they've they've got the president and then they've got uh, products and then for each product they have a manager and then for each kind of more functional oriented area they've also got a manager so you've got product managers and functional area managers in this particular case and you know this is um, this is a common structure or Lots of times, even if an entity doesn't have this full-blown matrix structure, there will be these little aspects of the organization that are kind of functioning in a, in a matrix level uh, because there will be, um, you just need more uh, expertise in certain areas. You need to narrow the scope of management in some cases. And so you start to um, you start to get sort of this matrix structure. It can be effective in some ways, uh, in that you have, um, you know, you have more experts in particular area of areas. You've got more um, sort of a, a alignment of people's skill sets with what they're doing. But you've also broken the work up into more uh, discrete pieces, and so now communication uh, and cooperation become um, more challenging because uh, things are broken up into into more more areas. So some terminology, some things that you'll hear talked about um, when you talk about management. Uh, span of management it's is really, you know, how many people report to you? How big of an area are you in charge of? Uh, it is not realistic for a person to supervise 150 people. Um, and so we have to think about, you know, this is part of organizing the work. What is an appropriate span of management? Uh, how many people, how many direct reports should a person have? Um, you know, what, what areas 
Uh, is a person going to be over? Do they have the knowledge and expertise and the skills uh, to supervise or sort of help integrate all of those areas? I think an over an over um, utilized word in the uh, management space is delegation. Certainly, um, delegation is an important idea. But more important is the more global aspect of trying to figure out how to organize and structure the work appropriately so that it can get done. Many organizations, when they're having difficulty, they'll send everybody to a delegation seminar and they'll try to figure out how to just push all the work downhill. And sometimes that can be helpful, but it's also possible that an organization can be doing more work than it should be doing because it hasn't taken the time to uh, strategically prioritize the work or organize the work in total in a way that it can be accomplished. And so delegation is just one of many tools that might be used in trying to think strategically about how to organize the work most optimally so it can be accomplished. Uh, responsibility and authority. We generally like to think of uh, if you're going to give person a person the responsibility for doing a certain thing in an organization, it's nice if you also give them the authority uh, to do that. Otherwise, they're responsible for something that they're trying to accomplish, but they can't they can't really accomplish it. Uh, so they're constantly needing to get, whether it be resources or time or, um, you know, budget, whatever it may be to actually accomplish the thing that they're responsible for. So in well-functioning organizations, we've aligned um, the authority with the responsibility. And now you might imagine that, you know, if you're thinking about those organizational charts from before, that might work pretty good in a divisional kind of uh, organization, but in a matrix kind of organization, it's like, well, who has the responsibility and who has the authority when a lot of these things are getting done by multiple groups of people or by teams? And that can be one of the difficulties with your matrix structure uh, is that it sort of can bog down uh, in the decision-making process. Uh, this gets to a, another idea. How much do you want to centralize things or how decentralized do you want to be? Um, centralization, uh, you know, everything goes up the hierarchy pyramid and then everything comes back down the hierarchy pyramid because lots of decisions are being made at the upper level of the organization. Um, th that can create uh, consistency and that can create a lot of control. Uh, what it doesn't do is create a lot of nimbleness. Um, it doesn't create a lot of efficiency and it, um, it can have a negative uh, impact on uh, job satisfaction and morale. Uh, decentralization, uh, you, you give up control. So you may not have, um, you know, you may get people starting to work towards goals other than what the organizational goals are. You may get some decisions that are um, less rational, uh, but you do get, uh, um, you know, things can move faster. The organization can be more nimble. Um, there may be the possibility of being uh, more innovative. Uh, so there's no right answer to many of these things. Uh, there's a lot of different trade-offs and an organization has to think about uh, where the proper spots are to uh, place these trade-offs. So a little bit at the end of the chapter in leadership. Um, leadership is a big idea. I often think that um, managers solve problems, at least decent managers solve problems. Great leaders prevent problems from even occurring, which is really a much higher level of uh, skill. And so, um, you know, part of leadership is the decision-making process. So just real quickly, autocratic, democratic consensus. Autocratic is just where one person dictates. Um, democratic is where we all vote. And then consensus is when we get the great majority of people to arrive at the same uh, decision. There's no right decision-making process here. Um, what you need to do or what needs to happen is that given different sets of circumstances, uh, different leadership styles need to be deployed. And in a perfect world, um, 
people have enough trust and confidence in their leadership to allow this to happen. So in a crisis management situation where speed is important, then autocratic decision making becomes very much necessary. Uh, democratic decision making, uh, you know, we can spend a lot more time considering something and allowing people to weigh in on a decision when we have more time. Um, and it, democratic decision making also works fairly well when the, the decisions are maybe of lower stakes. And then consensus is kind of an important idea. If we need everybody to pull their weight and participate in the implementation of the idea, then we better make sure that everybody's in uh, when we adopt the idea or we adopt the decision. And so all of these decision making models are appropriate in different circumstances. Um, so don't fall into just one or think that just one is the right way to do it because there's, you know, there's different ways to go about things depending upon the circumstances. Um, Laissez-faire is the idea that you're sort of hands off um, or you let things uh, work out on their own, that not everything needs to be explicitly managed. And then, um, Transactional versus transformational. Transactional is uh, as simple as if you do this, then I'll do that. It's a it's a pure trade. A transformational is really this idea where we're actually trying to invest in people and as a whole person help them become better. Uh, with the idea that um, that is uh, good for us, good for them, good for society. It's just a a, um, a greater goal that we help humans uh, sort of try to reach their potential. Um, so you will see different managers and at different levels of the organization, these things done uh, in different ways. Um, so if you get a chance, take a leadership class, think about these ideas in more depth because they are uh, big ideas and very important. Here's a graphic on uh, the control process. Uh, you know, standards, measures, uh, compare the performance, uh, figure out the deviations, and then take corrective action if needed. Uh, this is a little bit, um, this is kind of a, a poor model in a sense, in that in step five, uh, it's not intelligent enough to recognize that you could take improving action also. So. Uh, this controlling thing, oftentimes this is related to a budget. So you create a budget, certain performance measures, uh, you measure the performance, you look at the variances, uh, you determine why things uh, are you know, way different than what you have planned, and then you try to correct for them. But what's missing here is uh, things can turn out way better than you thought they would. And when things turn out way better than you thought they would, you should be, particularly in a, in a subunit of a business, you should be looking, well, how did they do that? Why did they do that? Um, can we take what they have done and deploy it across the entire organization? Um, so this model right here sort of assumes that what we've planned or what we have uh, uh, set as the measure is um, is the only thing that we're after and, and sometimes improvement can be found by finding uh, a unit of uh, organization that's creating or that is working and functioning at a higher level than even what our expectations were and then studying that to try to figure out whether or not we could deploy some of its characteristics across an organization. Uh, so we can look for variances or deviations from the expectations that are both positive and negative and then we can try to manage the exceptions back up but part of doing that may be trying to figure out where where we over uh, achieved uh, and what we might learn from that and how to deploy that across an organization. So different skills for managers, um, you know, technical skills might be things like accounting or being an engineer. Uh, interpersonal skills might be, um, you know, problem solving and troubleshooting, um, you know, helping people, uh, work together better as a team. Uh, conceptual skills is maybe uh, the bigger picture strategy, uh, the vision, 
uh, type of stuff. And then, of course, communication is the ability to articulate all these things and um, uh, disperse them out into an organization through the communication process. Time management. You know, it's really something that uh, we all do on a daily basis or don't do on a daily basis where we manage and structure our time optimally uh, to meet our goals and objectives. And then decision making skills. I often think that, you know, success is just a high batting average on decision making, right? There are uh, hundreds, if not thousands of small decisions that we make on a daily basis and that an organization makes on a daily basis. And if we make more of them, you know, better or uh, if we have a kind of a high average in terms of making good decisions to bad decisions, then we start to move forward and progress. And that is true both of us individually and as entities or organizations. And, you know, we're just now starting to see that people are becoming more um, interested in decision making. Uh, I think that we're more aware now uh, from psychology, uh, many of the biases exi that exist both uh, within individuals and organizations. And we actually, within my lifetime, there's been the development of what's referred to um, at some of the four-year schools as decision sciences, which is really uh, trying to be better decision makers, both by understanding uh, the human condition and psychological bias, but also by deploying uh, statistics and modeling and uh, other tools to try to get us, uh, you know, just better and better at the decision making process. So these are all uh, areas that you might consider uh, pursuing or developing. And of course, you may already sort of recognize that maybe you yourself have uh, um, you know, are really gifted in certain areas and maybe are less skilled in other areas. And so those are uh, things to consider. Here's a problem solving model. Um, yeah, it's a problem solving model. Um, it, it, sometimes you will see these, uh, I guess I'm a little bit more familiar and a little bit more of a fan of a circular model rather than just sort of this um, linear model um, and this linear model sort of assumes that you start and then it ends and I don't think they really um, I don't think they really uh, mean it that way I think maybe in some ways it's just a function of uh, of creating a graphic in a textbook or, or whatnot because you'll notice in step stick step step six woo they've got uh, monitoring uh, and so oftentimes I'll think this of this more as a loop where we work through something and then when we get to the monitor monitoring, we're really starting back over at step one to figure out how we take it or move to the next level or, or create uh, a process of continuous improvement at that point. But I think that um, it's worth thinking about problem solving models. You know, they usually involve identifying the problem, articulating the problem. Uh, trying to uh, understand the problem, usually by gathering some data or more information. Maybe at that point, you've got to really clarify the problem. Uh, at some point, you brainstorm uh, some different um, solutions. Uh, you evaluate those solutions, and then you usually implement uh, what you think is the best one. And then, like I mentioned before, sort of monitor and work through um, evaluating it to see if it needs to be tweaked or further refined. Uh, or maybe it was not the ideal solution and you need to go back to the drawing board and consider some of your other options uh, that you had identified before. Or maybe um, it just really didn't work because your uh, understanding of the problem was not sufficient. And so I like this as a loop where we come back and um, try to figure out uh, if we got it right or if we can um, continue to make it even better. So that's a, that's a broad overview of management. Um, again, you can, you, know, you can do a lot of studying in management. There's a lot of relationship to uh, organizational theory here. There's a lot of relationship to just general human psychology. Um, there's, of course, big chunks of leadership. And so you, you will see... Um, you know, management classes in your future, leadership classes in your future. And you, you may not necessarily think that, um, you know, you're 
specifically destined to go into management. You may be thinking that you're a marketing person, a finance person, or an accounting person, and you're going to focus on uh, developing your technical skills more so than your uh, management skills. But that doesn't mean you're not going to be, um, you know, we're all going to be interacting in these systems and in these structures. And to the extent that we can understand the goals and purposes of management at a higher level, I think the more we can help uh, management to be more uh, to be more effective and to create better organizations. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll uh, we'll catch up again in the next chapter.